Okay, so let's begin our session on foreign exchange market. Foreign exchange market is a very dynamic marketplace where currencies are traded, currencies are purchased and sold. And it's an international market. It's primarily an electronic market. So let's look at how foreign exchange market works and who are the market participants and uh, how does the trading take place and how does the exchange rate get determined in the process and so on. Market participants, uh, participants in the foreign exchange markets, customers, commercial banks, Central Bank, that's Bank of Japan, exchange brokers, overseas foreign exchange markets. So these are the participants in foreign exchange markets. So for example, I mentioned here Central Bank, Bank of Japan, in case uh, if you, this is an example. In Japan, the central bank's name is uh, Bank of Japan. And commercial banks, they buy and sell currencies. They have something called interbank market and they buy and sell from the customers. And then if they are buying from customers, they will sell to other banks in the interbank market. If they are selling to the customers, if customers are giving some foreign currency, commercial banks will have to square up that position in the interbank market. And in some countries, there are exchange brokers and overseas foreign exchange market also participates in the exchange rate uh, in, in, in the foreign exchange markets. Factors determining exchange rates. So what actually determine the exchange rate and, and, and uh, why do the exchange rate fluctuates and how do you actually forecast the exchange rate looking at the factors determining exchange rates. So factors determining exchange rate can be classified under these headings, balance of payments, inflation respective countries, central bank intervention, strength of economy, political factor, speculation and bandwagon effects, interest rates in respective countries, exchange control, daily export receipts and import payments. Balance of payments, uh, strength of economy and interest rate in respective countries. Inflation in respective countries. Central bank intervention we discussed already. Political factors. Political factors also play an important role sometimes. Exchange control rules, for example, currency convertibility. Can the currency be convertible or not? Speculation bandwagon effects. There are some big speculators. Sometimes they speculate and they announce that US dollar is likely to appreciate or US dollar is likely to depreciate. So those kind of speculation. Daily export receipts and import payments. Yeah. Sometimes daily export receipts and import payments. These are also, this is also one of the uh, factor. Yeah, so here, if you look at balance of payment, balance of payment is the balance sheet of the country for the rest of the world in a given year. Inflation in respective countries. If there are two countries, if there are, let's say, inflation in respective countries, which we, we actually discuss this inflation point with reference to purchasing, sorry, interest rate parity theory. You know, interest rate parity theory explain inflation in respecting countries and how does exchange rate is likely to move when inflation is high in a particular country. So, if inflation in a particular country is high, that country's exchange rate, that country's domestic currency is likely to depreciate or that country's domestic currency is likely to fall. Inflation is an indicator for the likely fall of the currency. Balance of payments simply means balance sheet of the country maintained in terms of foreign currencies with the transactions, you know, for the transactions with the rest of the world in a yearly account. And if there is surplus in balance of payment account,
that means that currency of that particular country is likely to appreciate if there is surplus in the balance of payment account that means surplus means surplus of foreign exchange reserves sur surplus of foreign currencies in my country or my country central bank my country central bank maintain foreign exchange reserves if there is surplus of foreign exchange with my central bank that means balance of payment of my country will be in surplus that is an indicator that my country's currency will appreciate but if there is deficit in the balance of payment account in that case i know that or i will know that my currency will fall my currency will depreciate strength of the economy if my economy is growing my country's economy is growing at a relatively high rate that means my economy is strong in that case what happens is uh yeah in that case my currency will go up my currency will appreciate if 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 uh my economy is doing very well however you know you cannot really predict the exchange rate fluctuation just based on strength of the economy because it's a very dynamic process so many factors like uh, i mentioned here 3 plus 3 plus 3 nine factors all these nine factors simultaneously determine the exchange rate one of the factors i have also mentioned daily export receipts and import payments daily export receipts and import payments coming in and coming out from a country this is also an important factor yeah so exchange control currency convertibility daily export receipts and import payments these are these are important factors speculation and bandwagon effects currency markets two segments cash markets derivative markets forward option contracts yeah so here currency markets have two segments one is called cash market and second one is called derivative markets so cash market then derivative markets forward option contracts etc so cash markets include exchange settlements immediately and derivative markets include forward option contracts yeah so for example you know when exchange rate is getting settled when a transaction is getting settled on the spot it is called cash market i mean there is a technical classification between cash and spot but uh, in real life it's more or less similar derivative markets forward option contracts etc yeah so derivative markets are so forward option contracts and this kind of things so which we can discuss in detail 
structure of the foreign exchange market. Uh, Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, the the participants in the in the cash market are are the same the customer, commercial banks, central bank, exchange rate, overseas forex market, or or there are all the other participants in the in the cash market. Yeah, so foreign exchange market has two two segments. It's like uh, coin. Coin has two sides the same way. This is what I'm explaining here. Suppose if you look at this particular PowerPoint slides, so the first segment of the market is trade transaction between a bank and a non-bank customer. You know, a bank and a customer. So for example, a bank and Wilfredo or bank and Norberto. So that is one segment of foreign exchange market. Second segment is interbank transaction. Interbank transaction means banks also buy and sell each other. For example, if bank, uh, you know, if bank is buying and selling different currencies from customers, bank does not want to keep that in the bank office. Bank will try to sell and buy these same currencies with other banks and try to make some profit from this because they cannot keep or they don't want to keep the cash or foreign currencies idle because idle, you know, keeping it idle is not going to be profitable for bank. So they will also try to trade this with other banks. So that constitute interbank transactions. And in that interbank transaction, interbank market, in the process, exchange rate will get determined because total demand and supply of a foreign exchange ultimately get accounted in the interbank markets. And some banks will say, I have US dollar to sell at this particular price today against Euro. And every bank will quote some price and in the, in the, in the, in the process, buyers will, in case if it is the quote, the rate quoted in the foreign exchange market, in the interbank market is acceptable to other banks, they will buy or they will sell. And in the process, exchange rate get determined. Are you clear or you have one more question? Oh, oh, thank you, I'm clear. Any other question? Someone else? So I classify here as trade transactions and interbank transactions. Okay. Let's move on. Different rates. Sport and forward rates. Premium discount. Yeah, so here, classification of exchange rates under sport and forward. Premium and discount. This is another classification. So, forward rate has two components. Sport rate, forward points. Forward rate is equal to sport rate plus premium or minus discounts. So forward rate, you know, so sport rate is like uh, uh, cash transactions or cash means it need not be exchange of currency, exchange of cash, but it is uh, considered as the current transactions, current, current transactions. So forward rate is the future date of future transactions. So forward rate can be defined as port rate plus premium or discount. Do you understand this? Why do you need forward rate? Let's say you are an exporter or you are an importer. Why do you need forward rate and under what situation you will think about forward rate? Well, I will think in a forward, uh, if I am selling something that is in the long, long term, well, I have to consider the time um, and that will imply that 
I will have to consider consider the forward rate for, for this, if I am selling some product that uh, that will have a, a long term um, service uh, that will that will cost me uh, or like that will imply that, uh, that the time will will cost me money. So I have to consider a uh, forward points for, for that kind of transaction. Yeah, so here, forward transaction, the need for foreign forward transaction arises because I give you an example. Let's say you are an importer in San Juan. You have signed a contract with the European company and the total invoice is in Euro, the European exporter is preferring to invoice in 15 in Euro and the total bill is 50,000 Euro. And when you sign the contract, you sign the contract or you agree to pay after four months or five months, let's say five months. Because many times when you sign the contract, you have to give sufficient time for the exporter. Sometimes uh, if it is very urgent, maybe one or two months, but otherwise if it is not urgent, you normally give three, four months time to exporters uh because uh, you know so you know, sometimes at least two three months time because and and again there could be shipping time so you and in case uh, the October into the contract you agree to pay only when the goods arrive in your country in that case there is more time for payment so total exposure time will be three months four months five months six months and all sometimes so many times it's three months average time so in that case, you don't know what is going to be the exchange rate for three months or four months from now when you sign the contract. Let's say you are signing contract today and your expected payment is three or four months from now or can be five months also. So in that case, you don't know what is going to be the exchange rate between US dollar and Euro and you have to pay 50,000 Euro from four months from now. And in that case, when you are not sure, you ask a bank, you go to a bank and then you, you uh, sign, you think about the forward exchange rate, forward contracts. You will ask the bank, can you lock in my price with a forward rate? Bank will quote a rate. And if that rate is acceptable as forward contract rate for you, you agree to do the transaction at the forward exchange rates. So that mechanism is called forward rate. Yeah, so here purchasing power parity theory comes again. So since we have already explained, I would not spend more time on this. So it is nothing but, uh, uh, you know, explanation of exchange rate in two different currencies. For example, exchange rate should equalize purchasing power if the price of a movie ticket in the US is $10. And if the same movie cost you 540 Japanese yen in Japan, in that case, exchange rate of US dollar and Japanese yen should be uh, Japanese yen 540 divided by US dollar 10, that is Japanese yen 540. So, I mean, you know, so I mean, it is, it, it is $10. Yeah. So, this is what is uh, purchasing power parity theory. Now, we are going to look at some examples. Let's look at this example of importer and depreciation of domestic currency. What happens when? Domestic currency is depreciating. What happened to the importer? Let's say Sanyo is a Japanese company and this Japanese company is an importer. Have you heard about Sanyo? Yeah, um, batteries in electronics. Yes, electrical appliances, electric, mainly electrical appliances. Okay. Sanyo makes electrical appliances and sell all over the world. It's a, it's a well-known Japanese company. And Sanyo places, let's say Sanyo is in Japan and they want to import something from Europe. They want to import chips from Europe. And the amount mentioned here is a hypothetical 1,000 euro. So let's say 1,000 euro, it can be 10,000 euro, it can be 100,000 euro. And when they place the order for importing chips from Europe, they have to pay after 120 days. That is a contract they are signing. 
with the European company. And Sanyo works out its costing or profitability on the assumption that Euro yen rate will be one Euro equal to 145 yen. The rate of exchange becomes yen 147 instead of estimated 145,000 yen. Sanyo would end up paying 147,000 yen, resulting in a loss of 2,000 yen. If you are the manager, what would be the step you would take to manage risk? Yeah. So now it is your turn to answer. Everybody should contribute in the discussion process. I mean, uh, uh, if you just consider the information here, I would absolutely buy a forward uh, contract. If I knew it was going to go up, the yen was going to go up, I would buy a forward contract to basically uh, uh, fix the price and avoid the risk of losing to uh, change in currency that doesn't favor me or my position in that in that in that moment. What about others? Yeah, I, I also um, um think that what well, Gabriel Gabriel is correct that I have to make a, a forward the forward contract because a, a forward rate because the for example the the other rate that the spot rate uh that is the current transaction will as a manager will not be um for me uh, good because I will be losing if I know that the the then will will I will have to pay on the future more for, for it. So I will establish the, the forward rate. So in that case, I, I could um, like manage the, the risk of paying more on, on the future. Yeah, so... Yeah, so here, yeah, so you know, so in case if you know that exchange rate is likely to move this way, so you will get a forward exchange rate quotation. And if the quote given by bank, if that rate is acceptable to you, you might agree. For example, you are expecting that yen is going to be 147 instead of 145 within 120 days. And you ask bank for a forward rate for 100, 120 days and the bank quotes you 146 and you are expecting that it is going to be 147. If you are expecting that it is going to be 147 and bank quotes you a forward rate of 146, will you buy forward contract or will you keep it open? I, I will go the four, the 146 because it's is better, no? Yeah, what else, what, what others think? I would like to hear from everybody. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, how do you answer this question? Um, I agree with um, Wilfredo also. We, if I'm the manager, um, factors that we need to consider like exports and import, speculations, and political factors. Okay. 
Professor, I, I think uh, Hafed is waiting, and the, uh, he was kicked out by by the Wi-Fi. He may get a pro problem. He's trying to get back in the class. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm back, Professor. I'm sorry. I'm having Wi-Fi problems. Yeah. So do you everybody agree that in case if it is 146, will you sign a forward contract? If, if you get a forward rate for 146 and you're expecting 147, what would be your decision? Would you buy a forward contract at 146 or would you keep it open and, and decide whether you know 147 or it can be uh, 145, so it can, be, it can be 143 also. But if you're expecting 147 and you get a forward contract of 146, what would be your decision? I think if the price is right, I would definitely buy the uh, 146. I would probably say, you know, I would avoid uh, uh, bluffing uh, when the uh, yen goes up to 147. No, but what do you think? Yes, I, I think that in this situation, the forward contract is the best solution to hedge the, the risk that the manager is confronting. Yes, yes. If you're expecting it is going to be 147 and uh, you get a forward rate for 146, it makes sense to book a forward contract. So now case number two, exchange rate and exporter. So this is a, a comparative example. Data, an Indian company is exporting to US and US importer would look at its US dollar cost. Look at Tata's price competitiveness in US. Same item is supplied by a German exporter. That's BMW. Let's say both Tata and BMW quoted price, 10,000 US dollar. And assume that one US dollar is equal to 1.565 Euro. And, and uh, Tata is an Indian company, BMW is a German company. And both uh, are interested in exporting car or car components to US. Both are car companies. And uh, yeah, so you say per, per car or per ton, whatever it is, you know, $10,000. Let's say both companies are quoting $10,000. In that case, and you have to also know that you have to assume that one dollar is equal to 1.565 euro and one us dollar is equal to indian rupees 48.10 then german exporter in that case german exporter would get euro 15650 tata would get rupees 481000 German exporter would get Euro 15,650 and Tata would get rupees 481,000. Now assume that Euro appreciate against US dollar say $1 is equal to 1.545 euro. If BMW continues to quote at $10,000, BMW would get only 15,450. That is, $10,000 multiplied by 1.545 euro instead of 15,650 euro. That is loss of 200 euro. So here, yeah. 
So, you know, this is uh, the case when like German exporter would get 15,600 euro normal price. So, but uh, you have to assume the next situation. So assume the next situation, the subject matter in the next paragraph, assume that euro appreciate against US dollar. Let's say $1 becomes 1.545 euro instead of 1.565. BMW continues to quote at $10,000. BMW would get only 15,450. That is 10,000 multiplied by 1.545 euro instead of 15,650. Yeah, so here, in this situation, BMW will lose 200 euro. If euro appreciate, that is uh, BMW's currency. That means if a local currency appreciates, that might result into loss of some money for an exporter. So here, the same example continues here. If BMW want to retain the originally expected and originally calculated amount 15,650, that is what BMW originally wanted. Then BMW has to increase its quotation to $10,000 and $129. In that case, US importer would prefer the Indian exporter. The learning from here is appreciation of domestic currency create problem for the exporters while depreciation of domestic currency help the exporter in terms of international price competitiveness. Yeah, so here, so you have to assume that both are exporting identical product or same product. It has to be same product, then only this comparison makes sense. Of course, this comparison is made to understand, to make you understand how currency fluctuation will have an effect on an exporter in two different countries, exporter of similar products. So my question to you is that, suppose, if let's say you are an importer in, in, in the US, and both BMW and Tata is selling same car, same quality. And if BMW increases the price from $10,000 to $10,129, will you prefer BMW or will you prefer Tata in this case? Hmm? You understand this example? Yeah, I mean it's more money. I I, I don't see why I would go with BMW in that case if, if um, the Indian exporter is selling uh, at, at a cheaper price. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, in this example, we talk about car, but in real life, it need not be car. And in real life, it can be fish or it can be onion. It can be papaya. It can be mango. You know, so let's say mango, mango, identical mango, same mango from two different countries. So this examples works in a better way in that case. So here I talked about car, but it need not be car. It can be some other items, you know, same item coming from different countries. And buyer need not think about, and buyer is assuming that the quality is going to be same. Whether I buy from Mexico or India or Germany, quality will be same. In that case, as a buyer, I would be price conscious if quality is going to be same.
So what is the lesson that we learned? So I would like uh, someone to read this learning or lesson. And I want someone to read this and uh, one more person to interpret this, discuss this. Jennifer, can, can you read this and someone else can interpret this? Okay, the learning is appreciation of domestic currency create problems for the sporters while depreciation of domestic currency helps the sporter in terms of international price competitiveness. Yeah, yes, I think that when um, the currency in a, in a place is is the it when the currency depreciates well it's easy for other other countries to buy products of of that place because it's cheaper in, in compared to the to the other countries um prices of their products mm -hmm. Yeah, so appreciation of domestic currency create problem for the local exporters while depreciation of domestic currency help the exporter in terms of international price competitiveness. In terms of price competitiveness, if you think. Uh, yeah, so, but, but uh, you know, depreciation, but depreciation of domestic currency causes problem for importers. So depreciation of domestic currency help exporters, but at the same time, it creates problem for importers. So it is the responsibility of the government and central bank to maintain exchange rate at a reasonably level, considering that depreciation of local currency will hurt, will create problem for exporters. Sorry, depreciation of local currency will create problem for importers and will help exporters. So considering that it has two side effects, Government has to maintain exchange rate or our central bank has to monitor exchange rate and then maintain exchange rate in a stable way, somewhat stable way. And it should not go beyond a limit or beyond a ceiling because it can create problem. Okay. This is a numerical exercise. If you have a pen and pencil, or if you have a pen and uh, paper, you can do this numerical exercise. You have a pen and paper or a notebook? Yeah. yeah. Try to read this and do this. Canon is a Japanese company. You have to assume that Canon is a Japanese company. Canon is getting a Euro bill from Europe. Someone, a European importer is paying 30,000 Euro to Japanese company Canon. And Canon want to convert this into Japanese yen. And the interbank exchange rate is 125.54 Japanese yen equal to one euro. What age should the bank go to the exporter bank request an exchange margin of uh, 0 
how much should be given to Canon in yen? Can you answer this? Mm -hmm. How do you answer this? Would you answer this? So here, bank needs some margin, bank needs profit. So that profit is 0 0.2 percentage. So it has to be 125.54 minus 0 0.2 percentage. That's the bank's profit. So in this case, yeah, so you have to you have to calculate that way and then multiply with uh, thirty thousand. So I have answers here in case if you want to take a look at. Yeah, so here is the answer. First, you have to calculate 125, you know, yeah, 0.2 percentage of 125.54, that is 0.25. And that will become 125.2529. And this also means that 125.29 multiplied by 30,000. That is uh, three lakh, you know, three, 300,000. Yeah, so it's a uh, 30,000 conversion. So first you have to deduct the profit margin from the for, for the bank from the exchange rate. And that is the exchange rate bank will give it to Canon and then multiply with the 30,000. Do you follow this? Is it easy or is it complicated? Hmm? Is it easy or complicated? So I'm confused in the first step, um, 125.54 times 20, 0.20%, right? Yes. And that is supposed to still be basically the same, but, and then the second step, why do we subtract the 0.25? No, this is the first step. The answer, first step, 125.54. This is not the correct answer. This is a, so you multiply this. If you, if, if you multiply this 0.2% of this, that this is the answer. 0.25 will be the answer. Okay. 
So 0.2 percentage of 125.54 is 0.25, right? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. So you have to you have to subtract uh, this 0.25 from 125.54. That is the exchange rate. So you get 125.29. Okay. And then multiply with 30,000. So this one, there is one extra here, 125.4. This is extra here. This is not required here. Okay. That's a typo. You understand? You follow? Yes. Yes. It only has two steps, calculating 0.2 percentage because that is bank's profit because bank has to survive, bank has to take some profit in all commercial transactions. So you have to uh, deduct that, subtract that, and then multiply with 30,000. So that will be the answer. And then, then we go back to question number two. Question number two is Suzuki Brothers, a trading company in Japan signs an import contract for food items from Malaysia on 1st June 20, 2012. And the exchange rate on that day is 105 Japanese yen equal to $1. Total amount to be paid is $35,000. Due date is 15 September 2012. Calculate the amount to be paid if exchange rate is steady. That is question number one. Question number two is If yen appreciate to 94 yen, then it is $1. And assume that Suzuki signs a forward contract for 102 yen, that is equal to $1. How much would be the liability? Yeah. So how do you calculate this? Mm -hmm. Okay. You have an idea for the first for the first part is basically multiplying, right? Uh, multiplying. Uh, the uh, 105 uh, yen times 35,000 uh, dollars. Yes. If exchange rate is steady, that means it is simple calculation. Yeah, first one is just straight away calculation. Second one is if yen appreciate 94 yen is equal to $1. Yeah, you, you will have to multiply the 35,000 for the 94 gen. Yes. So, Yes. And next question is assume that Suzuki signs a forward contract for 102 yen equal to $1. How much would be their liability? That is the next question. Uh, 
it will be the, the, the same exercise, the 35,000 multiplied for the 102 yen. Yes, so everybody, do you all follow this or do you have confusion? If you have confusion, I can explain. Otherwise I have answers in the next page. What do you think, Gabriel, uh, Jennifer, Norbert, and Jafat? Do you do you follow this? Yes. 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 It's clear. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. So the answers are given here. You can see 135 multiplied by 105. That is uh, 367,500. Yeah, so then uh, 35,000. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a multiple by 94, multiple by 104. So, yeah, it's 35,000 multiplication. Yeah, this is the there is one extra here, there's a typo here. Okay. So it's simple calculation. So it's 35,000 multiplied by 105, and 35,000 multiplied by 94, 35,000 multiplied by 102. So this is this is how it works. And and uh, forward contract, uh, you have to decide whether to book a forward contract or not looking at the situation. Sometimes you might find it uh, the need for find the need for booking a forward contract. Sometimes you will not feel like to book a forward contract looking at the future exchange rate. So you should be also in a position to forecast the exchange rate to some extent. Okay. <clears throat> 